Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Spring Hill Avenue, UMC, worshiping at Westside. It is a joy to be in worship with each and every one of you, and I love the energy that's going on in the room. You can just kind of feel it this morning. It's a good energy. Uh, <laughs> During this time, I want to invite you all to stand as you are able or in spirit and let us join together in the greeting and opening prayer, which can be found in your bulletins. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. That your way may be known upon the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let us pray. God, who is zealous for us, we confess that far too often our commitment to you is lukewarm and half-hearted. We turn our passion toward things that are not of you when you desire our whole selves. Remind us once more that following you is an endeavor of all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And may we draw ever more enthusiastically toward you. In the holy name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. In this time, I want to invite you to turn in your hymnals to number 383 and let us sing together verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 of This is a Day of New Beginnings. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, it is a joy to welcome you to Spring Hill Avenue UMC, worshiping at Westside. Do have a couple of announcements for you for this week moving forward. Uh, first and foremost, want to thank Miss Beth Atkinson for being here with us and, and filling in uh, with our music today. Uh, it's always a joy to be able to tap into our connectional system. Miss Beth also plays music for St. John UMC, and we're just grateful that you are here with us this morning. Uh, so a couple of other things to make you aware of this week. Uh, the first is that the uh, service of death and resurrection for John Butler will be this Wednesday, May 25th, at 11 a.m. at Pinecrest Funeral Home. Uh, if you would like more information about that, feel free to reach out to the church office, but we'll be meeting this Wednesday, 11 a.m. at Pinecrest Funeral Home. 
Um, we do want to let you know that we have many opportunities for you to get involved uh, in the life of the church this week and moving forward. Uh, we do have a Sunday school class that meets every Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. We have two Bible studies that are meeting right now, a Sunday evening Bible study that meets at 6 o'clock p.m. in the fellowship hall and is unpacking the book of Daniel right now, and then a study on the on First and Second Kings that is meeting Tuesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. in the fellowship hall. This Thursday, May 26th, we're having an assembly day. And that's just the only word I could think of to describe the day that's going to happen on Thursday. We're going to be uh, working to put together uh, all of the furniture and decorations and everything that we have accumulated thanks to your generosity and the kindness of so many people uh, for our Quad W interns. So we're going to be upstairs here uh, just assembling everything that we have, putting together the rooms, making sure everything is cozy and ready for them to arrive next Wednesday, June 1st. We're almost there. They're almost here. Uh, so want to invite you to come and participate in that. It's pretty much going to be going on all day. We're going to be starting at about 9 a.m. Uh, to make that possible, but feel free to come and go as you please. I said it's going to be going on pretty much all day until we have everything in place and ready for them. Uh, and then, if you would like to be a part of our welcoming group, uh, we're going to be welcoming the interns on June 1st, that Wednesday, and doing a, uh, a welcome celebration for them. Uh, we That's tentatively set for... Uh, Four, between 4 and 7 p.m., we're still trying to nail down the date, the, the exact time as we figure out when everybody's flights are coming in. Uh, but if you would like to be a part of that, just come up to the church anytime on that Wednesday and you'll be able to meet some of our interns and welcome them on that day. This coming Friday, uh, May 27th, we're having our movie on the lawn. Uh, that's going to be, since we don't have a lawn here, at Spring Hill Avenue in the uh, big grassy area out there at 6.30 p.m. We're going to have popcorn and drinks, bling, bring chairs and blankets, and we're going to be uh, watching the movie Encanto. And uh, we will not be talking about Bruno while we watch it. All right, that's what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> For the month of May, our outreach team is having the mission project to collect socks for USA Women's and Children's Hospital. Uh, we're still doing that through the entire month, so if, uh, feel free to bring socks up. We have a donation box in the uh, fellowship hall. You can bring those up anytime, and at the end of the month, we'll, we will be uh, donating those to the hospital, and uh, we'll be starting a different mission project come June. And. With that being said, oh, I also do want to point out that you can find in your bulletin on the insert there on uh, one side of it uh, that uh, talks about the Quad W Missional Internship. A couple of other things that we are trying to get in the last few days. Uh, if you would like to just donate monetary donations, we can cover it through that. But if you have these items or would like to get these items that are left on this list, just let us know. We'd be happy to receive them. But we're, uh, for the most part, most everything that we have up there is uh, ready to go. And we're so thrilled for that. So. With that being said, in this time I want to invite you to stand as you are able or in spirit and let us join together affirming our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
Amen. You may be seated. And in this time, let us turn our hearts to the Lord as we hear this morning's scripture lesson. The scripture lesson comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Pursue hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who, who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. During this time, I want to invite you to stand as you are able or in spirit and turn in your hymnals to number 408 and let us sing together the gift of love. Amen. You may be seated. During this time, as we prepare to present our tithes and offerings, I do want you to know that your giving does make a difference in the life of this church and the life of the church universal. It is by your generosity that we have been able to prepare such a home for our uh, missional interns who will be with us this summer. And I implore you, if you uh, have the means and opportunity, to just go upstairs, uh, even today, and see all of the stuff that your generosity has been able to provide. We're going to be able to comfortably house these interns uh, for this summer and not only for this summer but uh, we have presented an opportunity for our community to house others in need and to also lay a foundation for uh, interns to continue to come for many years and so your giving does make a difference in the life of this church and the life of our community. I want to offer you this reminder from 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7 which says each of you must give as you have made up your mind not reluctantly nor under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
I want to remind you that your giving can be done online at shaumc.org by mail to our P.O. Box number 7097 via text to give by just texting the amount to 251-244-2706 and also via our uh, kiosk that's available in the lobby. And with that being said, let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the many blessings which you have poured out upon us, both seen and unseen. Now, as we return a portion of those blessings back to you, we ask that you would bless both the gift and the giver, that each might be used to glorify and magnify your name among the earth, and that by our generosity we might see the world transformed. We ask this in your perfect and holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And in this time, I want to welcome up all of the children for this morning's children's moment. Hello and good morning. So do you all know what sign language is? Yes. yes. Sign language is the language that people who may be deaf or hard of hearing use to communicate with the rest of the world, and they use their hands to make signs. Well, I've really enjoyed sign language and learning it, and one really interesting one is the sign for help. Do you know what that sign is? I used to. Yeah, used to. Same. I'll see if I can remember. <laughs> uh, so take your right hand and put your thumb up in the air like this, and then your left hand and put it out like this, your palm up, and then set right hand on left hand. And to do help, you lift it up, and that's help. And now this sign is really cool because this represents the person who needs help. And this represents the help. We lift the person up. Sometimes there are people around us who may need help and we might be able to do something about it. And so we think of ourselves as the left hand, somebody who can lift that person up. Other times we might be the person who needs help. And in those times, we have to be willing to let people help us out. And so then we're the person who sits on top and somebody else lifts us up. But in all of this, no matter if we're the person lifting somebody else up or if the, we're the person being lifted up, we remember that we work together and we need each other because we can't do everything ourselves and somebody else can't do everything themselves, so we work together to help. Does that make sense? Well, let's pray together. You repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your love and the love of others that helps us and our love that can help others. May we always remember to be helpful. Amen. 
Thank y'all so much. And so for Kids Shine today, we are following Miss Hatsy to Kids Shine. So y'all have a great time in there. Uh, I believe there's uh, throwing stuff in trash cans today. <laughs> so have a great time. <laughs> Let us uh, go to the Lord together in prayer this morning. God, we come before you during this time acknowledging that the life of a disciple is work, and it can be difficult, and it can be exhausting, and yet we remember how worth it it can be to make a difference in the world, to love the way that you loved, and so we are faced with the challenge to live the life of a disciple with excitement, with enthusiasm. May we do so all the days of our lives. And in this time, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts on your words be good and pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we finish the acronym of LIFE. As we've been talking about disciple life, we've been unpacking uh, the different words that make up life and how that applies to the life of a disciple. And so we started with the L, learning. That's the very foundation of what it means to be a disciple, is to follow in somebody else's footsteps and learn from them. As disciples of Christ, we follow in the footsteps of Christ and learn from the example that Christ has set for us. Then. As we're learning, we also remember the importance of the I, intentionality, to live in such a way that it is impactful, to be decisive even. It's not something that we just do whenever it's convenient for us or something that we do uh, haphazardly. It's something that we do with intentionality to make a difference. Last week, we unpacked the F, fellowship, and how uh, fellowship distinguishes disciples from just good students because good students can be uh, excellent learners and very intentional, but disciples work together in fellowship with one another and they spend time together and they acknowledge their place in the body of Christ, that we all have a role to play and not every single one of us is capable of being everything to all people, but we are all things to all people as we work together. Today, we acknowledge that these three, the learning, intentionality, and fellowship, are not very impactful without enthusiasm. So when we talk about enthusiasm for the rem remainder of the time, I uh, want us to distinguish that we're not talking about or trying to describe being hyper. And we're not trying to describe uh, being overwhelming to others. And what I mean is, uh, I, I definitely was this person whenever I was in high school, and I really regret a lot of the things I was in high school, but I was definitely this person who was like, have you heard of Jesus? I need to tell you about Jesus. He's just fantastic, and, and it's just so exciting that you just need to know this. So let me just invite you to church, tell you about all of these things, and you're just go your life is going to be transformed. Yes, <laughs> exactly said, I might want to go to decaf. <laughs> That's not the enthusiasm that we're talking about today. Uh, because, well, I don't know if you noticed, but that can be a little bit off-putting to people. <laughs> Most people don't like you in their face uh, to trying to convince them with all excitement that they can't even understand what you're saying, and they certainly don't want to be around that all the time. No, the enthusiasm that a disciple has is, uh, is that which demonstrates that we care about this, Christ, this mission, this life, more than anything else in our lives. So I want to tell you a story about probably one of the most transformational books I ever read whenever I was younger. Uh, but before I get to the actual book, there's a little bit of a backstory to it. Does anybody remember the band DC Talk? Handful, yeah. This is like 
late 90s band. Uh, most of the, all of the people who made up this band are now with other bands and doing their own thing and stuff. Uh, DC Talk was like the, the introductory band to get Christian music into like the hip hop scene. Uh, and it was, uh, and hey, I, I had a great time with it. But their, their most uh, famous song became an anthem to my life, particularly in high school, uh, but for all, all of my life. And if you know DC Talk, you know the song I'm talking about. It was the song, Jesus Freak. And the lyrics for the song, it, it kind of like wanes back and forth between this rock and ballad and then hip hop. And it's very interesting to try to navigate. Uh, but the chorus of the song uh, goes like this. What will, I'm not gonna sing it for you. What will people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus freak? What will people do when they find that it's true? I don't really care if they label me a Jesus freak. There ain't no disguise in the truth. Uh, and so the, the premise of this song, and it tells the story of a couple of people who are living their lives enthusiastically for Christ uh, and, and have this derogatory term, Jesus freak. And you might even recall back in like the mm, 80s, early 90s, that was kind of the derogatory term for Christians who were overly zealous about their faith, Jesus freaks. And DC Talk kind of reframes that to say, I don't care. That's what's true about it. I am excited about Christ. I am a Jesus freak. And I'm going to be undignified for Christ. And uh, in all of this, what they end up doing is they, the band, DC Talk, joined with a group called the Voices of the Martyrs. Uh, which is, you could learn more about that in your own time. But uh, they ended up writing a book called... Jesus Freaks, and it's a compilation of narratives, stories, of people who willingly gave up their lives for Christ, who didn't deny Christ whenever it was most important. Uh, this book uh, originally came out in 1999. They've since revised it, I think, in like 2014 or something like that. Um, and and it, it tells all of these different stories uh, dating back to the very first martyr, who was Stephen in the book of Acts there, uh, all the way up to modern day, people who even still today, I think their most recent story is from 2018, uh, for, uh, who, uh, people who are continuing to live enthusiastically for Christ. And so I want to uh, tell you one of the stories, and uh, I'm going to tell you this one because it's one of the more tame stories in here. Most of these kind of get a little bit graphic. Uh, the experiences that people get. Uh, this story comes from the 1500s uh, in the country of Flanders. Anybody know where the country of Flanders is? Yeah, where is it, Will? Yes, that's right, Belgium. Yes, and in the 1500s, there, uh, it doesn't matter, the French politics of it all. France was the dominant force in Europe right in this time. But yes, uh, the area of Belgium. Uh, this particular story follows a young lady named Ronken, and uh, they tell the story this way. I found one. The Inquisitor held up the forbidden book as he called to his assistant. Bring in the mayor and his family. Someone is studying the Bible in this house. In the 16th century, Philip II sent the Duke of Alba to Flanders to stamp out the Protestants who insisted on reading the scriptures in their own language. Anyone found studying the Bible was hanged, drowned, torn in pieces, or burned alive at the stake. The inquisitors had found the Bible while inspecting the house of the mayor of Brugge. One by one, family members were questioned, but everyone claimed they knew nothing about how the Bible got into their house. Finally, the officials asked the young maidservant, Runken. I am reading it, she declared. The mayor, knowing the penalty for studying the Bible, tried to defend her. Oh no, she only owns it. She doesn't ever read from it. But Runken chose not to be defended by a lie. This book is mine. I am reading from it, and it is more precious to me than anything. She was sentenced to die by suffocation. A place would be hollowed in the city wall. She would be tied in it, and the opening would be bricked over. On the day of her execution, as she stood by the wall, an official tried to get her to change her mind. So young and beautiful, 
and yet to die. Runkin replied, My Savior died for me, I will also die for him. As the bricks were laid higher and higher, she was warned again, You will suffocate and die in here. I will be with Jesus, she answered. Finally, the wall was finished except for the one brick that would cover her face. For the last time, the official tried to persuade her, Repent! Just say the word and you will go free. But Runkin refused, saying instead, O oh Lord, forgive my murderers. The brick was put in place. Many years later, her bones were removed from the wall and buried in the cemetery of Brugge. This is just one story of hundreds, even thousands out there, but hundreds that are documented in the book Jesus Freaks. People who were enthusiastic enough about their faith that it ended up costing their life. Uh, other stories in there might be even more familiar to you, um, like the young girl from the Columbine shooting. Uh, stories of faith in which people declared their enthusiasm for God. Now, I will acknowledge that those of us who here today who live in the Bible belt of, you know, the free country are probably not at risk of being murdered for our faith. This book still applies to us, however, uh, because there's something that we're more afraid of than death. And that's getting outside of our comfort zone. That's actually living for Christ in our community right here and making a difference that calls us to action. And so I would encourage you, implore you even, to find this book, Jesus Freaks, and read the stories there about the people who would sacrifice everything because they were enthusiastic about their faith. Romans 12, 9 through 21, our scripture lesson today, uh, has this expression in it. Uh, verse 11, do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Do not lag in zeal. Uh, the word that we have here in the Greek is the word zeo. And zeo means to show great zeal, to be ardently passionate. But most literally, the word zeo means to be boiling, like hot water boiling over. Is to be deeply committed to something with the implication of accompanying desire boiling over with interest or desire. To be earnest, to set one's heart on, to be completely intent upon all of these various definitions to be boiling over. Now there's uh, another point where we get this. Uh, so the word zeo only really appears twice in scripture, here and once in Acts. But the uh, conjugate forms of this word uh, show up in other places, most notably in Revelation chapter uh, 3, verse 15. Now, you know, book of Revelation, all, all kinds of excitement going on in there. But this is probably one of the most familiar passages from that book, if not you know, the entire Bible. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus speaking to the church in Laodicea, telling them, you're not hot, you're not boiling over, and you're not cold. You have, you're lukewarm somewhere in the middle, and it's just boring and bland, and there's nothing here that declares Christ in the boring and the bland and the unenthusiastic. The word for, the, for hot there in Revelation, uh, when we look at that one, you are neither hot nor cold. The word for hot there is the word zestos, from which we get the word, can you guess? Zesty, yes, oh, such a good word. Uh, so for a moment, I want to hear your thoughts. What does the word zesty mean to you? Spicy, yeah. Exciting, yes. Potato chips. <laughs> Some zesty. Taco Bell, absolutely. Yes, God. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, to be zesty is to be full of flavor, to be something that's exciting, to, to, uh, to have an accent to it that it is 
different from what is bland, right? Zesty foods, we kind of lean more towards zesty foods, foods that are more exciting. Uh, me, personally, I love the spicy foods. Uh, yes, so I, I love that this word kind of carries over into modern language, that zesto. So whenever, whenever Jesus is speaking to the church in Laodicea, I know your works, you are neither hot nor cold. What Jesus is saying is, you're not zesty enough. Imagine that. Whenever Paul is speaking to the church in Rome, do not be lazy in being zesty. I wish we would use that word more often in the church. That's a good word for Christians, let me tell you. Do not be lazy in being zesty. So we now wonder, what does zesty, enthusiastic discipleship look like? And this is where we turn to the context around verse 11 in Romans, where it says, do not lag in zeal, do not be lazy in being zesty. Uh, Paul starts out by saying, let love be genuine. Right? Uh, fun fact, that's what people today are looking for, authenticity, genuine love. I had a lovely opportunity this past week to talk with a friend of my sister and brother-in-law's, and we were just talking about the, the life of the church, and it became so obvious. He, he's not actually participating in church worship services on Sunday because he, he was looking for a church that's authentic, one that's genuine in love, and that's what most people today, particularly Gen Z and millennials, are looking for. Authenticity, genuine love. Paul goes on, hate what is evil, but hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection and outdo one another in showing honor. This is a zesty disciple right here. Do not lag in zeal, but be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Persevere in prayer. That's a zesty disciple. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the lowly. Oh, can you imagine? Do not claim to be wiser than you are. All right, if I could just go ahead and slip that Bible verse to every person who's ever been on TV in the past uh, ten, five or 10 years, right? Uh, particularly our politicians. Uh, do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Ooh, that's a zesty disciple. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's a zesty disciple. Now. Uh, we, I, I'm always a fan of, of putting things into context because content, like we have in Scripture, plus context equals meaning. Uh, the context that Romans 12 sits in comes, well, believe it or not, Romans 12 comes right after Romans 11. And Romans 11, that's, that's the, this great shift that Paul puts in the middle of, uh, of Romans where he starts talking about grace, being saved by grace, not by anything that we do, right? There's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. There's nothing that we can do to earn the love of God. And then we get into uh, chapter 12, and all of a sudden it's a little bit more, I'm going to say, legalistic. It it's, almost sounds like a rule book. And like I've said before, the Bible is not a rule book. Uh, if, we were, if we were to just simply read Romans 12 out of context, we would see just this list of rules, things that we're supposed to do. But if we take it back into the context of Romans 11, what Paul is saying is that the grace of God which saves also transforms. And what that ends up looking like in our lives is genuine love, loving one another with mutual affection, outdoing one another and showing honor, being zealous, being zesty for Christ. The life of a disciple in other words, is marked by how intensely we live. And again, this isn't the hyper, overwhelming expression of Christianity. This is about an intense form of Christianity for ourselves, one that actually goes beyond my personal faith and out into the world. 
one that goes beyond my own beliefs and gets out there with other people. Because you might notice that every single word that Paul recommends for us as being adapted by grace is relational. It's about how we interact with other people. And it's about how we represent God. And he's saying, do it with zeal. Do it enthusiastically. Be zesty disciples. And so, my challenge for us today is to live as enthusiastic disciples. Romans begins with the expression, and this is in chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's saving power for everyone who believes. I am not ashamed of the gospel. In other words, I've got a story to tell. I've got something that I need to, for other people to see. Again, this isn't the hyper-overwhelming Christianity. This is the kind that is in fellowship, the kind that is intentional, the kind that is based on our learning experiences, this kind of enthusiasm, the kind that is, and I'm going to keep using this word, and I'm probably going to use this word for the rest of my life, zesty. That kind of discipleship. Because you know a zesty disciple from a very bland, lukewarm disciple. A zesty disciple is just going to have that something else. A zesty disciple is just going to be just a little bit more peppy, a little bit more excited about what they have in their lives, a little bit more willing to show up in the name of Christ. Whereas a lukewarm disciple is one who's just here because we're here. And that's what we do. And it's what we've always done. And that's what we're going to keep doing because it's what we've always done and we're told that's what we're supposed to do. Well, I'll tell you what. Jesus never asked for lukewarm disciples. In fact, Revelation is pretty clear. Jesus spits out the lukewarm. Uh, the actual word there, the, our translation is pretty polite. Uh, the actual word there is vomit out lukewarm disciples. But Jesus is looking for zesty disciples. Disciples that are enthusiastic. Disciples that are going to make a difference through fellowship, through intentionality, through their learning. The last characteristic ends up defining the others. It's one thing to learn, but to enthusiastically learn is something completely different. You actually want that knowledge. You want that experience. You crave it. That's every teacher's dream, right? For to have students who are enthusiastic about their learning, who actually want to take it in and aren't just there because that's what they're supposed to do. Being intentional is one thing, but being intentional with enthusiasm is something completely different. Because we can be intentional about the things that we say, but when we add enthusiasm to that, we see that it takes on a whole new meaning that we really want to invest in that, that our decisiveness as disciples are, is, is built on this excitement, on this joy. To fellowship is one thing, but to fellowship with enthusiasm is something completely different. We can be in a crowd of people saying we f we're fellowshipping and we still feel lonely in that crowd of people. But to fellowship with enthusiasm means that we are doing this because we want to be around these people. We love these people. We're excited to be with these people. Enthusiasm ends up defining the life of a disciple and it placing a particular emphasis on all these other characteristics. And as we're going to move this into Pentecost, not next week, but the week after is Pentecost. As we move closer into Pentecost, we're going to start to actually make all that we've been talking about here a reality for us. We're going to be launching life groups, groups that are built around learning, intentionality, fellowship, and enthusiasm, groups that are going to be uh, encouraging us to gather together beyond just worship. Uh, this Earlier this week, our guidance board had a visioning meeting, and, uh, and I, I told them something, a, a vision that I've had for, for our church. Uh, 
which is that worship, this time that we have right here, this one hour on Sunday mornings, that it would become a backdrop in the life of our church. I think worship is important. I think we need to worship and gather together, but I don't think that it's the most important part of being a church. I think the most important part of being a church is actually making a difference in our community. I think the most important part of being a church is actually gathering together to learn with intentionality and fellowship enthusiastically. I think the most important part of the church is something that we miss whenever we just show up for this one hour on Sundays. And so I'm wanting this time to become a backdrop. We're still going to be doing it all the time. It's an important part of church life, but there's so much more that we're missing if this is all we do. Jesus is looking for disciples. And not just any disciples, but disciples who are willing to get into the lifestyle of a disciple. And the lifestyle of a disciple is built on those who are willing to learn as lifelong learners. Those who are willing to be intentional and decisive about every action they make in the name of Christ. Disciples who are willing to fellowship together, to grow together, learn together, be together, support one another, rejoice when one rejoices and weep when one weeps. Disciples who are enthusiastic and zesty about their faith. So let us be zesty disciples, enthusiastic about what we've been called to. And let us pray. God, you have called us to be more than idle bodies, to be more than simply taking up space in this world. You've called us to make a difference. You've called us to be people who show up. And you have given us the tool of the church that we might grow as disciples and that we might go forth and make disciples. This church is not a building. This church is a people. And as people who are after your own heart, guide us on as disciples who learn, who are intentional, who fellowship, and who are enthusiastic about our faith. Give us that zest that we might be missing in our lives, that enthusiasm that takes us beyond these four walls, that takes us beyond our seat in the pew, that takes us beyond just talking about it and into a life of doing and making a difference. For we remember those who have gone the extra mile to make a difference in the world enthusiastically. We remember those who have fully embraced the title of Jesus Freak, those who live passionately for you. May their lives be an example to us that every step we take, every choice we make, might be something that impacts our world and our community, might be something that makes such a difference that the world can only see that it is you and not us who are working. You say that the world will know that we are disciples by our love, so let our love be genuine let us go forth from this place to love as you have called us to love with all zeal because we look out at a world so desperately in need of the love which you grant us and acknowledge that there is suffering going on in our world we could scarcely imagine. Suffering we know all too well. And in all of this, we need to grow, that we might be your hands and feet in the world to alleviate suffering, to alleviate hatred, to bring about your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May we do so with all enthusiasm as your disciples. We lift up these prayers as well as those which are unspoken and on our hearts this morning as we pray now together that prayer which you taught us and your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. During this time, I want to invite you to stand as you are able or in spirit and turn in your hymnals to number 558. And let us sing together, We Are the Church. That's a pit. <laughs> well, uh, before we dismiss, I do want to remind you of a couple of quick things. Uh, this Wednesday, the service for John Butler at Pinecrest uh, Funeral Home at 11 o'clock a.m. This Thursday, all day, 9 a.m. till whenever we finish, we're doing assembly day here at the church, getting stuff ready for the interns. And Friday, 6 o'clock p.m. at Spring Hill Avenue, movie on the lawn. We'll have popcorn and drinks, bring your chairs and blankets, and we're going to have a great time. And with that being said, receive now this benediction. From wherever you may be or wherever you have to go, go to live as zesty disciples, living enthusiastically, being in fellowship with one another, living intentionally for Christ, and in always learning as disciples. And may the God of all goodness give you peace. In the name of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Go in peace.